What's going on? Welcome into Horse Players Happy Hour for another week. My name is Matt Bernier, joined by Jonathan Kinchin. This is brought to you by the Breeders' Cup, along with In the Money Media. JK, obviously, everyone, you've got the hottest podcast going as far as horse racing is concerned, JK plus one. But we have to obviously tip the cap to the In the Money Players podcast. That is the that's the homegrown. That's the first and foremost. But you're on an absolute tear as far as this new pod is concerned. Uh, it, it's been a ton of fun, man. It's, it, you know, it's, it's more about the guests, I think, in, in the format more than anything else. I, at least I like to tell myself that. Um, I just think just the opportunity to, to kind of have a conversation that you don't typically, typically get to see. You know, I've, the five guests I've heard, I, I've, I've pulled out a couple of stories from them that we haven't heard in their 50 interviews they've done throughout their career. So that's, uh, that's kind of the idea. And, and doing it in that long form mode kind of allows the conversation to flow, the comfort to happen. And uh, I've always liked to kind of get the uh, see the other side of people. So it's been fun, man. I, I tell you what, last week, Travis Stone's story about his race call uh, about a filly by the name of Radiant Cut uh, at, at Aqueduct <laughs> was uh, was was quite the story. I can only imagine. It's one of those things, too, where I feel like I remember when you first started chatting about doing the the sort of new format, the long form conversation sort of in the same vein as Joe Rogan or some of those other podcasts that it's more just sit down conversational. It it feels a void that that has been in this sort of podcast space and horse racing, whether it's podcasting or radio or whatever it may be. We all like to chop up the races. We all like to go over and give our opinions. But very rarely have we had a a show that has done what you're doing now, where you kind of you can pick the people's brains and get to know them a little bit better. So I definitely uh, commend you for that kind of flipping the game on its head a little bit. We have to acknowledge I don't want to say the elephant in the room, but. Typically, when we do these horse players happy hours, there's three of us here, and, and PTF is the one that's driving the show. PTF, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I mean, look, it's a good thing. Uh, he's over with Sky Sports here this evening, uh, so he won't be joining us, but we will have Jake Ballas coming in here in a little bit. Uh, he's got a big filly running this afternoon, and uh, you were one of the first ones to tip me off when she ran uh, up in smoke. She's going to be making her two-turn debut in, in a stakes race on a sloppy going down a Gulfstream. Yeah, I'm really excited about her. Obviously, uh, she's the type that is exciting because she's undefeated. But I think the more exciting part is how she's done it, right? She's uh, the first race. She pops out of there, uh, sits right outside like a good horse on the pace and and draws away with Irad Ortiz. Irad, uh, there was some jockeying going around, no pun intended. And then Johnny Velasquez picked up and Jake Ballas has a great long, long standing relationship with Johnny. And uh, she just didn't seem interested in the first part of the race, kind of ran herself all the way out of there and then came running late uh, to win. And she did something similar last time. So it's it's interesting to see what's going to happen. Maybe the stretch out kind of plays into her hand, but she's an exciting horse. Uh, it's always fun to look down on the PPs and see a whole bunch of ones, regardless uh, the level, regardless uh, if it's a great one or not. Now, there are other big names in there. Tonal of Shape is in there. A couple other nice fillies that will be stretching out, trying something different. We've got plenty of time to talk about that race, but it's 4.33 right now. The reason that we've been here for these horse players' happy hours, we've been playing in the contest, these feeders, to get into a qualifier for the Breeders' Cup betting challenge. But most importantly, all the proceeds from these events go toward Thoroughbred Aftercare with TAA and TRF obviously being the, the main ones here that we've – We've all developed a great relationship with them. And I feel like I've said from Jump Street, we can talk about the human connections, no question about it. Obviously, everyone's important. But when push comes to shove, without the horses, there is no game. So we got to make sure that we take care of the horses when their job on the racetrack is done. That's what the proceeds for these events go to. It's a $20 buy-in. And this week's a little bit different, JK, than what we've been used to. Typically, these Fridays, if you get in, let's say, whatever the number ends up being, the top X percent or the top X number, qualify for Saturday's live BCBC qualifier. Uh, this week's, if you finish in the top whatever the cutoff ends up being, you qualify for next Friday's BCBC qualifier. And that's actually what our Horse Players Happy Hour broadcast will be with next week. Yeah, the stakes will be a little bit higher. <laughs> Instead of getting $165, you'll be staring down the barrel of 10000 So mm-hmm. uh, that'll be a lot of fun next week. Looking forward to that. Um you know, it's, it should be a lot of fun. Look, these contests, these feeders, that's how I got started, man. The first contest I ever played in was a Breeders' Cup qualifier where I, I you know, I spent the 50 bucks qualified and, and I turned that one into my first Breeders' Cup betting challenge entry. And uh, the rest has been all uphill, as they like to say. So um, that was my first in 2014. Got to go out to Santa Anita and hang out and, and had $10,000 in my pocket. Not for long, but uh, <laughs> I had 10000 in my pocket when I got there. 
You know, and it's one of those things, too. I can only speak for myself. I don't want to speak for you, but I know there are a number of other people as well. Uh, I've played in the Breeders' Cup betting challenge twice, but I'm not someone that's going to put up 10000 necessarily just because it's a lot of money for me. So winning your way in this way is one of those where you know, even if it doesn't happen right away, you kind of afford yourself a little bit of a window where you can sit there and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm willing to pay X amount to try to get myself into it. If I don't want to put up the 10 grand or whatever the case may be. And I think that's one of the, one of the beauties of what horse players and horse tourneys do where it's, it's a feeder. Genuinely. It's one of those things we, we remember back when poker was really kind of, you know, top of the mountain, as far as television was concerned here in tournaments and things like that. And you had so many of those guys qualifying guys and gals, through smaller events to get into the main event. And uh, frankly, I, I know you've said it, and I mean this wholeheartedly. I love the NHC. Don't get me wrong. Uh, there, I feel like there are a few majors, but to me, the Breeders' Cup betting challenge, there's it's second to none. No, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the NHC is a great event and an event that I'll always try to participate in for the rest of my time on this earth. Um, but the Breeders' Cup betting challenge is a little bit different for a couple of reasons. One is because it, the ability to really press that large – that, that strong opinion that you have. And you're not just pressing it on what happened. This is no offense, but you're not pressing it on a 10 claimer at, you know, wherever fairgrounds, Laurel, Santa Anita, I'm not picking on anyone. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not your whole $800,000 NHC life is dependent on those situations from time to time in the breeders cup talking about championship horses. You're talking about the best of the best. You're talking about being able to go all in off on a, on a mare like beholder going all in on a horse like American Pharaoh going all in on found and, and, uh, and uh, golden horn, which our friend Tommy Massis Tommy. did the year that he won. So there's a, there's a lot of different things that you can do, but you also get to show up to the greatest racing event that we have to offer in this game and, and watch all the, uh, all the champions. It's a ton of fun. And, and I think you bring up an important point, you know, this is the beauty of the breeders cup. You, you may be looking at a 10 or 15 to one shot. That's a multiple graded stakes winner many times over in the largest jurisdictions that we have. And you can approach that a little, I would think a little bit more confidently than you would like you say a 10 claimer. If you're playing in another event, it's why the BCBC is just the, to me, it's the end all be all that. That is the contest. If you're going to play in one contest, I love right. all the other ones. Don't get me wrong. The NHC very, very obviously, you know, has its credentials, but the BCBC from a racing quality standpoint, from an environment standpoint, and just overall, uh, the, the racing itself makes that the best possible event, in my opinion, that we can come across. We've got about a minute to post for race number nine at Tampa. So we've got a little bit of time left here to get things going. Our first race for the contest doesn't kick off until the eighth at Gulfstream. We've got a little bit of time. Craig, are we good to go with Jake Bowles? We are good to go. I believe he... Hey, man, I appreciate you having me. I'm doing well yourself. Oh, we lost Jake. That's all right. We'll bring him back. We'll get him back. (laughs) Just guess what? It's a little bit of a tease. You know what I'm going to ask here. Um, All right. You know, it's it's a. I'm a little nervous. Just anytime you have a horse run, you get nervous. The, you know, like you said, we're trying two turns. We're trying. You know, we're just going to be in the slop. So those are two questions that no one has answers on. Her pedigree suggests she probably better as a sprinter. I don't think anyone's convinced if she's a sprinter, if she can go two turns. So we're going to give it a shot. And I think today's a good chance or a good opportunity to see what she can do. But we are excited about it. And the tone of the shape is going to be obviously very tough. But we have a really nice filly. And, you know, at the end of the day, if she doesn't like the distance, we'll cut her back. And we think we have a very nice filly moving forward for the rest of her three-year-old year. Go back and watch some of these giant stretch runs of hers. Uh, she looks fantastic out on the racetrack. What sort of tipped you guys off as far as her possibly being a prospect that you wanted to get involved with? George Weaver was at the the Maryland sale, and I, I was I stayed home and I was doing some video work for the sale, and he called and had a couple horses on the list, and I sent Angel Cordero a bunch of videos to see which horses he liked. And that was his favorite one. It was Angel's favorite one was this gray filly, and that was George's. So they matched up, and we just said, whatever it's going to take to get her, we're going to go after her. And that was, uh, you know, she, we breezed her one time at Saratoga. She had some bone bruising. Uh, so never had a surgery, anything major. We just had to give her the time for her to grow and mature and get over that. And, uh, you know, she was, she was training okay going into her first race, and she exceeded our expectations, uh, you know, a little bit. We didn't expect her to 
to run as you know like she did but we've been very happy with her JK, I know you had uh, kind of tipped off early before we came on the relationship between Jake and his family and Angel. Why don't you uh, dive into that a little bit? I mean, that's been that's been uh, that's been one of my favorite parts about being friends with Jake is getting to meet and, and hang out with Angel. Um, if you've never had the pleasure of of being around Angel Cordero, I know a lot of uh, racing fans are obviously huge fans. When I ask people who's the best riders. They've ever seen Angel's name comes up, Lafitte Pinkai. Those are the names you always hear over and over again. But Angel's an unbelievable man. He's so much fun to hang around. He's got an unbelievable per personality. And, you know, when Jake talks about something I think is really important is that, you know, Jake and Angel don't have a financial relationship when it comes to this horse thing. It's a it's like a family. And I think what's really interesting is, is Angel has spent every day of his life around good horses. Uh, you know, I think at one point he galloped Uncle Mo and you think about all the horses that he sat on and, and, and breathed and watched walk by in the mornings. And, and uh, I think he just has a nice feel for what a good horse looks like. And you, you combine that with, with Jake's diligence and, and the team that Jake's put together, you know, I think it's a great combination to kind of try to try to find a diamond in the rough. This game's hard, you know, I mean, guys go out and, and gals as well, go out and buy horses all the time and they're not good and they're expensive. And I think that the ability to, uh, to try to find the good ones is it's, it's not easy. Jake, from a relationship point how did you first get involved or introduced to the game my dad had horses in new york in the 80s and angel rode a lot for him and we got out of the game when i graduated college my graduation present was to go to saratoga uh, for a week and i went by myself my family didn't go i didn't know one person and i ended up linking up with angel coincidentally at a city tavern on a on a monday night I was, I was sitting there by myself having a beer and i asked the bartender hey you know where can i go tonight i had no idea where can i go tonight where there'll be a lot of people and he said well you know, around 10 o'clock it gets really busy upstairs the jockeys have a party so i went upstairs around that time and a whole a lot of little people and i'm six <laughs> seven so it was so i walk first guy i see was just this, this, this guy and i walk up and said hey if Sorry to interrupt you guys, but y'all know if Angel Cordero is here, I'm trying to find him. And he looked up and he said, if you don't look my whatever, he said, I'm Angel. <laughs> and I, so I said, okay, I mean, I didn't, this was, you know, you weren't even Googling on your phone, you know, looking at photos. And, and then next night I went to dinner and then he took me to the Derby the next three or four years in a row. And, I, you know, sat and he got the boxes from Johnny and Todd. So we're sitting on the finish line, third floor. And, uh, then Angel bought us our first horse back in 08, and he ran in the Derby in 09 at 50 to 1. And uh, we haven't been back since. Uh, kind of when we first got back in, and I thought it was easy. First horse we buy, we run in the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> but we're still we're still trying. Do you guys have a sort of, you know, you bring up you've run in the Derby before. We've obviously got a talented filly here this afternoon. Do you – typically go one way or the other you're looking for colts and geldings you're looking for fillies is it sort of do you have a preference one way or the other no um uh, whatever the best athlete we see at that time we were not looking for a colt versus a philly and you know she happened to be a, a big beast florida bred uh so we we like to run in new york and uh so just <clears throat> whatever we see that we like and uh, we try to go after and seems like uh we were on a roll there for a little while. The last several years have been a little slow, but hopefully now with Up and Smoke, it gets us back going. As far as a gambling perspective is concerned, on, on a day like today, you know, we've spoken to other people in the past that are involved with horses, that they've got them running and whatever the case may be, especially with a filly like this where it seems like the sky's the limit. Do you find yourself wagering on a day like today, or are you content to sit back, or are you nervous at the point where it's like, you know what, I got enough skin in the game already, I don't need to get involved with anything else? I, yeah, I mean, I have enough skin, so today I won't, you know, if I do wager, I'll play maybe something to win on her, uh, I'm a singler in a pick five, and, you know, just spend hundred, two hundred dollars uh, just for something for fun, uh, but no, so no, on a day like this, I don't. And if this was tomorrow with Churchill's card, I would be focusing on Churchill and I would just watch her. But today I'll play something around her and I uh, hope we get lucky and win. And if I, if I lose my bet and we win, I will not care one way, one bit. <laughs> Don't let Jake fool you now. He's, he's got, he's, uh, 
He's got a. He likes to remind me often about his positive ROI that he's that he's toting around for the year so far, and he he uh, he likes to send screenshots of that as often as possible. <laughs> it's been a it's been a decent year this year. <laughs> Big fella, what uh, what do you think? Uh, what what do you think? You think back to New York, uh, obviously this summer, if if all goes well, obviously the world around us is a little bit uh, confusing and you don't know what's going to happen. There's going to be spots in between there, whether she wins or loses today. But you think, um, you think New York is, is where you'll try, try to get back to with her with George? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I mean, ideally they would open the track to fans and we can go watch her on the backside of Saratoga. Uh, but yeah, we're going to go to New York with her. And today's going to tell us a little bit about the distance. So if we, if she proves she can't get it, we'll just focus on one turn races and, uh, see how we can work our way to, you know, the big races in New York. And I know on its speed figures and buyers, her numbers aren't that impressive, but I'm not paying attention to those with her. I'd rather watch her races visually. Uh, but yeah, we'll get her to, to New York uh, probably after, I would imagine after this race, and you know, unless Keeneland has something in July, which they're talking about. So maybe we ship up here and then go to New York, but hopefully for the summer and fall, we'll be in New York. You brought up a good point, and you know, and, and Matt, I wanted to get your take on this as well because you know, Jake, we've obviously talked about it offline, but the fact that her figures haven't been, her buyer speed figures haven't been particularly fast, doesn't really bother me because in her, you know, her first one was fine. It was if it was the debut that wasn't was was actually pretty quick. It was probably her fastest buyer speed figure. But then the the two races after, but the the, the tricky way in which she kind of falls out of the race and then comes running. I, I think that that little cork is probably uh, affected the final time, which is obviously what the buyer is built on. So I'm excited to see her stretch out. I, I think that stretching out is going to keep her from falling back so far. Matt, how do you handle a horse that you think is talented? All signs are point, pointing to talent, but the figure isn't exactly as sharp as you'd like to see. Well, especially for a filly like this, where she's only run three times. I'm not terribly concerned about it just yet. If we don't start to see a sort of upward trend, that's when you start to get a little bit leery. But I'm more concerned with how she looks on the track. She's done everything professionally in all three of her starts. Like you say, when she makes the front, I love the fact that she levels off and goes on with it as opposed to sort of biding her time and waiting for other horses and all that sort of jazz. I like that she's just been as professional as she has. And and like I said, right now, I'm not terribly concerned about the figs, but there is going to come a, a point in time where you got to look at it and say, we got to start to pick it up. But she's so lightly raced that to me, I'm more concerned with how she looks on the track. Is she hanging on her left lead? Is she being goofy? Is she looking at the grandstand? She doesn't do any of that stuff. She does. She looks like a seasoned vet out there, and she's only run three times. So uh, I, I don't know how other people approach it, but to me, that's what I'm most concerned about. I want to know, are you professional at this point, knowing that you don't have a lot of seasoning? She checks all the boxes there. No, for sure. I mean, And the other thing is, like, it, it, if, you, if you close your eyes and convince yourself that she wants to go long – exactly how she would be running if she wanted to go on right she'd kind of fall out of it she's not really interested in being hustled along early she wants to kind of do her own thing and then when she's ready she'll come running if she does that she translates that to to the two turn efforts um she could be she could be tricky as far as this contest is concerned just keeping everybody abreast it says zero minutes to post we know Gulfstream. we probably got a couple more minutes here uh looks like right now we're at around 150 entries so that would be the top 15 moving on to next friday's BCBC BC qualifier, which we'll be on for. Again, that's that's a little bit of a wrinkle of this week compared to the weeks prior. Typically, it's been qualifying for the Saturday event. This is going to be for next Friday's event, which we'll be on for again as well. So the more the merrier. And, and I've joked about it, but it's it's true. Even if you are in a position where you, you're going to buy your way in, you've already got a BCBC BC or two entries, whatever the case may be, there's nothing wrong with playing here. It's 20 bucks. You get involved, have a couple of beverages on a Friday afternoon, and it all goes to a good cause. Uh, Jake, from a contest standpoint, do you typically play at all? I feel like I've seen your name a few times. I've, I've played a couple of times, and it is something I would like to get more into. Uh, <clears throat> but as of now, I haven't I haven't played any this year, but I have played some in the past. And, uh, hopefully, we'll see my name coming up here in the future. <laughs> JK, from uh, an entry standpoint, man. are you rolling with one, two this afternoon? What's your plan? Oh, and I was telling you, I've been busting people up in these head-to-heads. My account was looking kind of sexy, so I went ahead and went ahead and got two entries. Fired away. So, uh, yeah, no, I got two. I I I I picked um I picked the same horse in every race except for the last. So okay, that's my that's my strategy. That's how I like to play with two. Um, Jake knows this, and and uh, I, I tell him I tell him this all the time as well, and I'll tell anyone who listens. You're going to be wrong 
more than you're right. So when you're right, you got to make them pay for it. And if you got to believe in your opinion, press your opinion, stop trying to catch and try to score. And and so I, I just try to, I try to be narrow with a lot of the things that I do. And, and that's kind of how I approach this one. I think it's another one of those things too, just str- from like a strategic standpoint. Uh, I believe uh, Anthony Trezza is the one who sort of coined the, you need to be, you got to be just accumulating points. Look, we would all love to end up clipping a, you know, 15 or 20 to one shot, but you got to be cashing in these events because there's only so many races that you're dealing with. So look in this opener here, I'll make no, no bones about it. I've got the even money favorite in here. Lovely lady Lexi. I don't know if she necessarily has a tremendous edge on this field, but I feel like she's the most likely winner in here. We're at a point now where it seems like I believe a rad is aboard. It feels like if he, if, if a rad's in a race, you at least have to look twice whether the horse looks like it makes sense on paper or not, because it seems like he's winning every other race down there. And again, the, the idea is I'd rather be connecting, even if it's just a place price, on a short price horse like this, because you've said it so many times in the past, that two dollars and ten cents or two dollars and twenty cents that can be the difference between qualifying or not qualifying. Oh, if I think back, I have nightmares about cents that have cost me thousands of just contests where if I just would have, you know, if the horse that got nabbed for second could have got second, I could have got that extra 10 cents. I'm, I get the $10,000 BCBC spot. So yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of zig and I zag with that. It, it, there's times where there's horses like, uh, um, like the horses down on the rail, lovely lady Lexi, where I'll absolutely take that horse and not think twice about it. And in fact, somewhere in my run here, I'm sure I have a very short price horse. Man, but I ended up landing on the eight gray jasmine on the far outside. She was 20 to one morning line. I'm assuming she's not that now, 13 to one on the board um, as it is. But she's drawn outside. It's a sloppy racetrack. Uh, I thought she ran well last time, first time for uh, Jaime Mejia. She got the win. She won by five after switching barns. So something, the light clearly came on for her there. Now she's drawn back outside. It's a sloppy racetrack. She shouldn't get much uh, much thrown into her face. I, you know, I talked to Jake earlier today, and I told him I was excited about about uh, Up and Smoke's draw. Where if she can be forward, she'll be in the clear at least. I think on these sloppy race tracks, these horses do not like having the mud kicked back in their face, uh, especially young horses. Uh, this isn't a young horse situation. I mean, she's three; she's only run six times, but um, she's never been on a sloppy race track. So this, if she gets mud in her face, it will be the first time. And so. I ended up landing on the eight gray jasmine at a big price. And I, I like to call it the protection of the chalk. If I'm wrong here and lovely lady Lexi runs off the screen, it's not damaging. Now I agree. I'd like to have the points, but by no means am I out of it. Do I need to start playing Madden? Cause this thing's over. No, and we've talked about it in the past too, where I, I feel like this was the conversation we had last week where, I, you know, I don't want to necessarily give out an even money shot, but if I just look at the paper and say, I feel like the horse is probably the best, I'm going to go that direction, but I'll do everything in my power to look for an alternative the way that you have here with this 13 to one shot. Uh, i got a little bit of time left. They're getting closer to the gate. So if you're trying to get involved, you got about, I'll call it 35, 40 seconds. Um, Jake, I don't want to put you on the spot here. I don't know if you looked at this race or not. Um, if you did, feel free to offer an opinion. If you didn't, as that this race runs, how do you see your race? playing out from a handicapping standpoint. Where do you expect her to be positioned? Well, real quick on this race, I'm going to go with, with Luis Saez and to, to beat the one. I, have, I mean, uh, that horse is three to two, but hopefully Louis heats up and we can, uh, he can get, a, get hot before our race. And I don't, you know, our race, I don't know how it's going to shape up. I know, I mean, the cheermeister should, and will go to the lead. And then, uh, I think Tonal of Shape's going to be very forward because last race they were saying he should have been or she should have been and she wasn't. So I think I think Irad's going to send her. It's not as fast as Cheermeister, and hopefully we can break and uh, we can sit a couple lengths off in the clear on the outside. I I hope we don't just drop to, to dead last like uh, she did a couple times. It looks like we've got one left to load, one or two left to load anyway. So this is going to get going here. JK, I'm not going to. Not going to have you call this one, but are you willing to uh, offer up the, the you've offered the past few weeks? Absolutely. You donate hundred dollars to TRF. Uh, send uh, send us a screenshot somewhere. I don't know where. Maybe uh, I'll I'll pull up the Periscope, or you can put it on Facebook or whatever. And uh, I'll call my third race in a row. I told Travis I'm coming for his job, so you better watch. Out. <laughs> well, you can see it obviously here on the screen. They're all running. The contest is now closed. We'll take a look and see when it's all said. What the final numbers look like and how many people are going to be up. For Spots leading into next Friday. You got a five to one shot cooking out on the front end. I was surprised Shook uh, clear as relatively easily as she did. Um, from this position here, you're starting to loop up on the outside, JK, in the clear. 
I am. I'll, I'll take a second at this point. I'm traveling, though. Right? Yeah, full of you, you look good right now. Come here, sweetheart. Let's get this day started off right. 22 and I 2 feel, for the I opening. I feel like Irab's going to run me down here, though. No, oh, my stick does not look good. They're Don't all going to have to run. 46 for a half. I'm going to have to run if they're going to run down this deuce. Oh, she's getting late. She's going to get, she's going to run third, run second. Ugh. It's looking like a 21. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 218, it looks like. Get yeah. things going here. I believe a five to one shot for the deuce. Yeah. Kathleen yeah. O'Connell coming in from Tampa off a little bit of a layoff here. Hunch, do you know where Sto where's, do you know Stonehenge? Who, who are they? Do you know them at all? No, I know the name. I don't know. I've never, I don't. I guess it must be somewhere down there. Kozan, what is what is? Have you seen any Kozans? Is is this? Is he going to be a good sire? I mean, yeah, I think so. Yeah, for down down in Florida, I do think so. Yeah. I thought I had heard someone at one point say he was off to such a good start that there was yeah. a chance that he'd end up moving somewhere, whether it's yeah, Kentucky or somewhere else. There, there are rumors they were moving him, and I guess that never that never happened. Uh, but he, yeah, he had a good year last year. But didn't Todd? Did Todd have that horse? Is that who? Is yeah, that who yeah, for Al, for Al Shakab. And he was awesome. Mm -hmm. and he, what did he run twice? Yeah, he, he ran twice, and then gee, very, very, very fast. Yeah, and this was Royal Delta's brother. Am I wrong with that? That's Delta correct. Princess, yeah, yeah. yeah she so sold it. She sold it. Faye Tipton, if I remember, when they had it at Adina Springs for maybe a million dollars, or off the top of my head, I could be wrong. Whew. Well, we got another Kozan winner here, and it, it, is has it started raining, Dan? Does that look my screen deceiving? It's possible. I don't know. Anyway, the, the point is 218 is your final order finish here for the first leg of this contest. Uh, you got a five to one shot on top of even money running second. Uh, Gray Jasmine runs third at 12 to one. Also, something that I feel like not enough people pay attention to from a uh, contest standpoint, especially with the way that they've sort of, I don't want to say tweaked the rules, but over time, shows matter. Hitting the board matters still because that's the tiebreaker. So we've talked about it so many times when we get down to that final race on these happy hours on Fridays where, you know, you got three or four people that are tied. The Running third matters in here. You may end up tying on the number, but if I've got a horse that ran third and JK doesn't or vice versa like we have right now, that could be the difference maker. Hey, let's do it. I'm trying to I'm trying to get off the schneid. I haven't qualified once for the for a for the next contest in this thing yet. I'm, I was I've been close. I've I thought going you did into last the week. last race. No, going into the last race twice, I've been in qualifying position. I've got nailed on the last race. Oof. No good. No, well, let's no. quickly shift our attention to Santa Anita because we have one minute to post. And look, it's good to have Santa Anita back in the mix. Good to have Golden Gate back in the mix. Uh, we'll have Churchill back in the mix tomorrow. Obviously, hopefully sooner than later we get New York up and running again. But Obviously, got to kind of fall in line and, and do what's safe and appropriate. But uh, with a minute to post, you've got a nine to five shot, the number three horse. JK, where did you end up going in here? This is uh, twenty thousand dollar maidens going six on the main track. I landed on the three as well. Um, I landed on the three as well. I, I, you know, look, it's it. The horse is dropping in from maiden special weight into to claiming twenty, and it's uh, Michael McCarthy who I think is one of the most. Uh, I don't want to say underrated because I think people know he's good, but maybe under the radar traders, trainers that's out there. Uh, horses like CC and City of Light. I remember a couple of Breeders' Cups ago, he had like five runners in the Breeders' Cup and had 25 horses under his care. So uh, when I see a horse dropping in and I see a horseman like Michael McCarthy, I defaulted there to Christmas Pickles. And plus, I just wanted to say Christmas Pickles. <laughs> it's always fun when you get a good name like that. Jake, did you happen to take a look at this race by any chance? I like the one in McCarthy. Uh, okay. McCarthy was he's ten to one. Just ten to one. Now he's what eight to five. So he's taking all the money. The inside runner stick up. It's going to be coming off a little bit of a layoff for Damato at seven to two. I look. This was a race. I had a hard time kind of making heads or tails of it. I, I initially looked toward the outside with Elemental with some speed, especially at this. You know, this is the bottom level maiden claimers in California. I'd like to be forward. I just thought it was interesting, and I looked up some numbers for Tom Bell. You know, this is not necessarily a, a strong move for the, this this outfit, but for Drayden Van Dyke to be listed, I assume he's riding. I haven't taken a look. I went with the 5R Bonnie last at 20-1. to 1. I kind of look at a field like this and say, you probably don't have to be a superstar 
to graduate first out of the box. And even if you don't necessarily win, if you can possibly get a piece of this thing at a big, big number, that would help as far as the place payoff goes. Uh, like I said, you look at some of the stats, there have been a number of these double digit types, and I think they've only hit the board twice in recent memory. So not a positive move, but in a race like this, and I'm curious what you guys would typically do. If if I don't have a good feel for the race, I'm I'm immediately looking for some sort of a number. Absolutely. You got you got to look for a price. And spe speaking of uh, uh, of uh, looking for things, it sounds like Jake's trainer, George Weaver, is looking for him. Jake, we're going to let you run. Take care of that. Uh, fingers crossed that uh, I don't like these calling you. I'll let you handle that. <laughs> Text me if something's yeah. going on. We'll let you run. Right. Good luck. We'll be rooting like hell for you. Good luck, Jake. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye, man. See you later. Be well. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. this is late, late breaking news, huh? No, I think he's probably just calling us to call. <laughs> he would have texted him or something. But I just Jake was like, uh we were calling me. And I was like, well, just, just talk to him. Um, you know, it's 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 these races I've I've become a little bit more accustomed to trying to respect the drop, even when the form isn't encouraging. Like for instance, Christmas pickles, like the form is not good. She ran awful mm. last time. I mean, didn't pick up her feet at all. So took a little bit of money too. Right. So I, I, I try to default to that. Um, but it's, man, it's, uh, these, this level of racing is tough for me. I've, I've always kind of struggled with it. it. It's, um, cause you just don't know the intentions. And we talk about the Breeders' Cup betting challenge, you know, the intentions, you know, yes. when Steve asked me and walks one over there, or Chad Brown walks one over there there, it's the Breeders' Cup. They mm -hmm. want the purple hat. They want the little trophy, you know, they want the champagne toast. That's what that, it, no, there's no questions about that. But when you when you get a horse like you know the two Pammy Dearest, I, I don't know. I mean, did, are they dropping the horse because you know I, you don't even, well, you know are they are they ran for fifty? Is she good? Is she not good? Are they here to win? Are they here to get a race in? Or yeah. uh, you just never know. So this is a I've always found these levels to be a little bit more complicated from a handicapping perspective. I still think your your theory too, and you were the first one that I heard speak about it. Given the the current times and the current economics of just the world in general, I mean, I feel like this level fits into that bill as well. Where perhaps in a different situation, some of these connections wouldn't be willing to to just kind of cut bait and drop one of these horses to a low level and say, you know what, if we win, great. But if the horse gets taken, it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, those aggressive drops, like I said, you were. Really First one to kind of tip me and everyone else off to it that I know. And I think it's a very, very important and pertinent point to keep in mind with any of these races. Well, you got to think there's a lot of guys that have been that, that have been paying bills, owners that have been paying bills, feeding horses, still doing vet work, but they don't have that opportunity to run in the afternoons to help offset that. So uh, the P&Ls aren't looking as good for everybody that, that, that have a business as, as an owner in racing. And, you know, you got to do some aggressive things to to make uh, make things work includes putting your horses where they can win you can't really afford to just send them out there let them run around in a circle and say you're giving them one you're going to run them next time you know that's it, uh it's, it's 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 hard to do that right now it's nice to be back out at santa anita see it in the afternoon racing going on we've got one or two left to load here um so you're after down this, uh, after, go ahead. This race, after this race maddie we got uh, you have the whole race to think about it and mm -hmm. you got to give me your favorite santa anita memory from your at santa anita memory that you can think of. I think I know which one you'll pick. Oh, it's you a layup. Your 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 favorite Santa Anita memory when you were at Santa Anita. I'll tell you what. There there are two. I'll give you the personal one and then the other one. But we'll wait till after this race. Oh, nice you, little... That's good. I can match your two and raise you seven. I, right. got, <laughs> I love that place. <laughs> Some of my Looks greatest like... moments, and most fun things in racing, Santa Anita. I uh, it's it's just it's such. I feel like a broken record. Whenever people ask, like, oh, what's your favorite track? You know, I, look, I'm always going to default to Saratoga. I love Keeneland. But when I got out to Santa Anita for the first time, when you walk up one of the ramps or you walk up the steps when you first walk through and you just see the mountains in the background, it it doesn't look, no matter what the television looks like, it doesn't do justice. It just doesn't. No. no. Clearly, they are off now, breaking uh, – at this low-level maiden claim, this is the second race of the contest. We'll up to be on the leaderboard after we get some results here for this 10 elemental. The horse that, look, I mean, I was flirting with the idea of saying, give me the one that's going to get out the front, but the layoff was a little bit of a concern. I didn't know if there was going to be other speed from some of these other runners. Um, this was able to clear off relatively comfortably, I'd say, to the front end going 21 and 4, which Anthonita, I know this is bottom-level maiden I'm not terrified of 21 and 4. Like the horse. No, I mean, look, I, I, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the nice way to say 
this, but with these horses, as the levels start to lower, they're all athletic beings. They're all fast to a certain extent. How long they're fast for, or it's their their desire to get their nose in front. So I, if I'm if it's a, if it's a lower level race, or as the level starts getting lower, I want the horse that's out front because some of them don't really necessarily want to pass. Now you found one that does want to pass, <laughs> but that horse was that horse was forward as well. You know, you, you don't see in, in ten climbers horses coming from the clouds. Oh, oh, and we just lost the rider. It looks like I think the two clip heels and dumped the rider down the inside. Yes, just the rider though. That's just the just the rider. horse. Just I think yeah. they clipped well, down the. Uh, we'll find out. Hopefully, we can get a little they're, they're bit. They're pretty of a, good. They'll, 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 uh, they'll update tweet. on things. Uh, yeah. So they'll tweet. Um, uh, but as far as the rate is concerned, that's a big number there. That eight horse, uh, fourteen to one on your winner. If you have we'll get, that one, we'll get, uh, we'll get our our other producer that's listening right now. He knows who he is to <laughs> text us. When he, yeah, if he, he keeps an eye on Twitter, yeah. so we can we can let everyone know uh, uh, what what went down there. I'm, I'm guessing that. Let's see who who was it. If we're in. Uh, Jorge Velez, I believe yep. that's. I think that's. It's Jorge, right? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. Gary Mandela's horse. Okay. Pammy so Dearest. We'll get, so update there. Uh, as far as this horse is concerned, this is again an exercise that I feel like it's. There's benefit to doing this. Going back and trying to say, did, was there something I missed when I first went through? Uh, I look at Don't Stop Looking. I always have a difficult time with the horses that are going from Low Sal to Santa Anita and back and forth. I just, for whatever reason, it's not a move that registers with me and I can't make heads or tails of it. Um, but having said that, you got that run two starts back at Santa Anita at the same level, only beaten by a length and a half at 60 to one. Now you get the job done here. They return back to the great race place at uh, going to pay about 30 bucks. Yeah, you know the thing about this horse, I think that that's interesting is that that uh, the, the trainer change is when you you know the trainer change you kind of saw that big performance, um, and now this is the second time for the trainer. So there was a, there was a hint that there was going to be maybe another improvement there. Um, and I agree with you, and, and I, I don't I don't I think that you absolutely need to look and see why horses win, why they won, and I I, I think that uh, even you know like Paul Matisse made a joke about that would be the name of his book if he ever wrote a horses win. Because it's a very interesting thing. You need to you need to index in your brain how that happened so that you can find it again when it comes. But that's there's a thin line between looking back, educating yourself, indexing how it happened, and allowing hindsight to affect your process. If your process doesn't find horses like that, turn the page and move on. You don't need to reinvent the wheel and try to then find those horses all the time because then it's going to prevent you from doing what you're actually good at doing. So it's a thin line. You need to look, but you, you don't need to, you don't need to, you know, sell your house. Well, and that's the thing too. I think we brought it up with one of the contests two or three weeks back where at Tampa there was a horse that won paid 60 some dollars. And, and we both looked back and said, I just, I don't know if it was Tampa or it was one of the races. And we said, I, you know, you, you could give me a hundred tries and that's just not a horse that I'm going to come up with. I think the sooner you recognize and accept that there are just going to sometimes be animals that you just, you have a hard time. I wouldn't bet with your money, that sort of thing. Just, you know, you tip your cap and you say it is what it is and try to get them next time and, and know that, look, it's still early enough in a contest like this. What are we running here this afternoon? We've got seven races, you know, the top 15 get in. I, I will take a look and see how many folks happen to have this horse, but it's far from a done deal two races in. And I think too many people get too discouraged too early on. And this pick Absolutely. and pray, obviously, it's a little bit difficult because your picks are in. And look, if you ended up chalking out for the entirety of it and a horse like this comes in, you basically need to run the table. But the the greater point is don't don't lose faith too early in things. You, long way to go. No. Stay the course. Stay the course. All right, let's do some. Uh, we'll do some, we'll do a couple things. We'll, we got a lot of things to do. We're gonna do a leaderboard. We're gonna do Santa Anita stories. I'm gonna update you that everything is fine with Up and Smoke. Jake is texted all good, good. no issues. George just wanted to say hi. I think no, I think he just was just calling to, to say whatever. And then I also need to uh, to know. I'm gonna open up the uh, Periscope to look at the, uh, the the comments. I need to know if anyone will be uh, offended or think that it's irresponsible for me to call my son out of his room to grab me a beer while I'm doing the show. I'll leave that to Periscope. I won't say I don't anything. think it's, I, I mean, <laughs> it's, I mean, I can't get up. I'm working. 
I mean, you know, he, he's fine. He can get, uh, I mean, the guy can make his own peanut butter and jelly. He can grab me a aluminum can out of the, uh, out of the refrigerator. I don't um, have a kid, so but he, I don't think that's a problem. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. Good. I just, you know, I'm making sure. Um, oh, Santa Anita. Oh, let's, Santa do, let's do leaderboard. Go leaderboard first, and then we'll do story. Well, I, they're, they're still looking at the stretch run, so it's not official just no, yet. Let's so let's let's wait till this second race goes official. And having said that, it may end up rolling right on to Golden Gate. But we'll wait till this thing goes official. We'll, uh, we got four minutes left at Golden Gate. There's plenty of time. Uh, mm -hmm. Which one do you want first? Do you want sort of the – do you want the personal moment for me that just like I, I lost my mind? Or do you want the – from strictly a racing perspective? Ooh, okay. Yeah, give me the uh... – Give me the uh, give me the racing one. I think my my answer is both. Is okay. racing and so I think, and I didn't even watch this race from the rail. It would have been 2016 and the Breeders' Cup Classic, where I was out and I watched the race in the paddock. There was no one there. Everybody is out on the front side, you know, watching the races down at the rail or wherever else they are. I had just wrapped up with NBC and I just I made a beeline out of there. And I went and watched on the big screen, one of the big screens in the paddock area, watching as California Chrome's out there cutting out the fractions. Looks like he's moving well. And I I, had, I liked Arrogate. I gave, I picked him. I just thought he was one of those horses where it felt like a two-horse race, you know, when you boil down to it. And they, look, they were a quarter mile ahead of everyone. And I don't remember who I was even standing next to, but they said, ah, oh, he's not going to get him. And I was like, don't, don't write this thing off just yet because he's a monster. And that that stretch run where he's able to go and run him down and then to go back and listen to some of the calls, I just to me, that was that's my most vivid racing specific memory of, of one individual race, Arrogate going and running down an older top level California Chrome. And they're both a quarter mile ahead of the rest of the field. Yeah, that was that was great. That was that, that was uh, that was one of my favorite races I watched there. I remember where I was. I was standing on the stairs with. Uh, uh, it was with my girlfriend, Casey and a few other people. Um, and it was fun, man. That was, that was great. Um, I think my favorite, ra I mean, obviously every time you walk up to Santa Anita and you walk on the apron and you see that's, that's the greatest moment, uh, the mountains and everything. Um, and another blanket thing is being in the Eddie Logan when the sun's setting, nothing better than that. Good but my favorite moment, I think, as a whole, is when I went to the Breeders' Cup in 2014, and I had been telling everyone that Bobby's kitten couldn't lose down the hill, couldn't lose down the hill, couldn't lose down the hill. And um, it was my first BCBC, and I blew my entire bankroll before Bobby's kitten ran. So I, I, I had money in my pocket, and I made the largest win bet I had ever made. And that was obviously very exciting because the how the race unfolded. If you've never seen it, you need to go to YouTube oh, and watch 2014 Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. He was the six horse. Um, but here's why it was great. I went that year. My, I hit up Tim Schramm that year. It was my first Breeders' Cup. I didn't know. And it's Santa Anita. It's so big. They can a little bit more loose with the tickets. Tim yeah. Schramm must have given me 12 just get in tickets. And I brought <laughs> all of my friends. And they <laughs> all bet on Bobby's kitten. And when you take friends to the track and you give them a horse that's not even money that wins and they all score out, there is no better feeling. And so from the personal standpoint, it was great because I was like, I was right and it was fun and I made a lot of money, but also all my friends scored out too. And uh, that was definitely my, my favorite moment at Santa Anita. But dude, I've had so many. I absolutely, I've been to that race, that racetrack, uh, probably more than any other racetrack. I mean, Saratoga is kind of tricky now because I went there 40 days last year and, you know, whatever, that kind of takes the cake. But, uh, yeah, Santa Anita, I'm so glad they're back open. Um, they had a rough couple of years, obviously. And so, uh, you know, the horsemen and the people on the backside, and, uh, you know, even it's like hospitality. And, uh, you know, I think of our friend Arcadia who, who works in the uh, in the Eddie Logan. And, and uh, you know, if, if they're not racing, she's not in the Logan working. And, yeah. um you know, obviously a lot of other people too. So glad to see their back racing and hopefully things continue to trend in that direction for, for Santa Anita and the rest of the, the world. The the best part about your story is that that was my other, the year anyway, of my other, my, when I lost my mind, it was the first year I played in the BCBC. And after the front runner, which is run in September at Santa Anita, American Pharaoh won by seven, something silly like that. 
and I just loved everything about Texas Red and the way that he finished and the way that he galloped out. And I know some people don't believe in the gallop out, all that stuff. When American Pharaoh scratched, I said, I mean, he's going to win. He's going to win for fun. And everybody's like, well, you know, he looks good. And, you know, Keith DeSormo at the time was still a little bit more under the radar. This was before Exaggerator. This was before, you know, he really kind of bloomed as far as on the, the biggest stage is concerned. And I'm, I go out and I watch the race and the pace is just supersonic. And I'm going, I mean, look, all Kent's got to do is just find a find a path. And I'm watching him weave through. And when he turned for home and he just opened up by, I think he won by eight, nine, something silly like that. And I had everything. I was still working with the racing form. And in the paper, I gave out the cold superfecta. Him over up, uh, Carpe Diem, over Upstart, over The Great War. I'll never forget it. It's, it's probably the greatest public handicapping piece I've ever made. But as far as the BCBC was concerned, I had him everywhere. I had everything. It put me in position to then bet 1,000 on work all week who won the sprint at 19 or 20 to 1. I put me to first. And then, look, I flattened out at the very end. But um, I will never <laughs> – I lost – you want to talk about any shred of professionalism? It was gone, <laughs> gone in the midst of that. And I've always joked about it. When I would go to Belmont Park, when I was still living in New York, I, I went. I might have gone to the press box three times. I said, I can't be here. I got, I got to, I got to act like an idiot. I got to snap. I got to root my horses home. And it's like a, like a sanctuary up there. So I steer clear of the press box just for that reason alone. I, I, you know, if I've got some skin in the game, I want to be able to get involved and root from home. So that was my most memorable story. moment. My favorite part of the story is I didn't really know you then. I knew no. of you, obviously, because of horse players. Yeah. And, and and so when I saw that you hit that horse, I didn't like Texas Fred in that race. I saw you hit the horse, and I saw that you had hit – then we crossed paths, and you were telling the story. How you, At some point, How yeah. you gave it cold – I thought you were a legend. I was like, man, this dude is a – he's a savant. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> he got to know me, and he was like, this chump, <laughs> this chump doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, oh, it was, I think I think the first time we met was NHC that year. Well, it would have been fifteen. Was yeah, that yeah. the year that you won the tour? Uh, no, that was the no. So, so fourteen that Breeders' Cup when you when you Texas redded that was my first yep. Breeders' Cup betting challenge, and yep. then that following January was my first NHC. Because I, if I remember correctly, me and PTF were there for the racing form, and you came up after we were done one day. We were just kind of spitballing, going over all the races, and and you were just you introduced yourself. And that was the first time I think like face to face we had actually interacted. It's crazy to believe that was, that was what, the, that five was years. The, uh, ago? That was the year that I had two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you were you had two in the top ten. I, do, I remember that. That was like one of the first like meeting things I ever. That mandatory payout. Yeah, that was one of the first meeting things I ever did. Sorry, for everyone, we brought you down memory lane. You don't want my golden opinion that. anyways because I don't know. I mean. I mean, look, I mean, whatever. I'm, I'm uh, what is it, the fifth, the fourth? What race are we in? This is the fifth. Oh, well, they're all I ended up, so I guess it I went with the four. Uh, I actually like this a fair amount. Trust about uh, Bear Chum. And you can only hope. I, I don't know what Bear Chum is. I mean, is that, that, that might be a human being, but um, I just thought for the reason, this kind of trip right here, you're going to be able to sit off of a couple of the speeds, beat a horse like Sequential on the square in the most recent run, coming off of a bit of a layoff, but they all are. Um, two to one, no bargain. Where did you end up? I used the three, getting that trip. You know, it's funny is when I play Golden Gate, I have to adjust, man, because I'm always looking for horses that are going to be forward. They're going to be on the lead. Um, if I find a horse that looks loose that can finish, I always fall for them. They never ever win. Like I, I'm, I'm going to call my shot here. The seven's not going to win. He's got his nose in front right here. Someone's going to run him over. It always happens. It just it feels like you, you can't wire there. I mean, I'll be very whatever. disappointed if I don't win. Head. Bear Chum has taken the lead, and it's Bear Chum going for the oh, finish. The, the three got over. out done. I don't, I don't know if he's going to. Coming on late, so is sequentially in long shot. Forty-two, man, but Bear Chum keeps rolling strong here at Golden Gate. He's yeah. one of two, three, like, five, five maybe. The synthetic specialist sequentially nice, was man. second. Passionate. Uh, I mean, look again. Not not breaking any over. you know wild news there. I mean, two to one kind of a straightforward horse but that's you're right at, at golden gate and i've i'm gonna start getting more into golden gate this year just because for a number of reasons but I, it's not a track that i'm super comfortable at as opposed to and it has nothing to do with the tapita it has it just has everything to do with it for whatever reason i don't have a good feel for the track because i'm very comfortable on the tapita at woodbine and i just feel like it's a it's just a totally different animal and i'm gonna try to really lock in over there 
uh, for these I think upcoming. A, I think it's a place. I think it's a place that if you do two things, you'll do well. If you track, if you just watch video, nothing else. Video, and you find horses that get bad trips, and you find races that have slow paces, and you have horses that are closing in at slow paces. If you just do those two things, I think you could do really well at uh, at Golden Gate. I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it's true. I mean, the, you want to talk about apples to oranges, dirt to turf. The tapita to the turf is like apples to um, something close to an apple. I'm, you know, I'm going down a bad, bad move here, but like Air? you get what Air? I'm saying. They look, like they look the same, same consistency. Yeah, right. You know, I mean, it, it's it, they they have you know a stem and you know some sort of a little leaf off the side of it. So that's <laughs> to me they're they're close. They're cl- much closer than. If it's not that, maybe it's the wet track. I took a shot here. He was seven to one as they loaded behind the gate. So um, it's not a strong opinion, but I kind of figured maybe some people will get a little bit leery that maybe he can't run anymore. And kind of going back to what I had mentioned earlier with talking about the big bomb down at uh, Santa Anita, I didn't have a strong opinion. So I wanted to make sure I was going to get a decent enough price in a spot like this. Makes sense. Uh, Matt, how, how much, well, how close are they? They're getting in there. They're getting um, close. How close, how how often do you use, and I use it as a huge tool, and I don't know if a lot of people that are watching or listening do that. I look at the double probables all the time. It's there's it's such an edge for you to formulate a plan on how you plan on attacking a day. If you're interested in, in betting a horse like up in smoke and you're not sure if you're going to get the value and what should you do here, should you bet this, should you not, you can look at the double probables and have an idea of what's going to happen and where you're at. Like I know right now, looking at the double probables, uh, tonalist shape, was uh, I think like seventeen dollars going in with the favorite going into her, and then into uh, Up and Smoke was like thirty eight dollars. So you know that Tonal Shape is going to be the favorite, and if you like Up and Smoke, you'll get a you'll get a nice price to better to win in there. So uh, using those double probables is, is huge. Also, I wanted just to say uh, Velez did get up and walk off Santa Anita. Obviously, we're not doctors. I don't know what happened after that, but he did get up and walk off. And the first check mark of of, uh, of traveling in the right direction. I will say Santa Anita, and I know a number of other jurisdictions that got great protocols in place. Santa Anita is at the top of the list as far as making sure that they're going to check over the rider 15 times to make sure that he's good to go. And if he's not, they're going to say, you know what, sit down for the day or however long it is and come back when you're feeling good. Uh, you and I are out there uh, on the front. My horse got pounded at the end. My horse got seven to one when they went behind the gate. He's now seven to two. Desert General actually clicked down to three. That's, yeah. a, diff- that that's, pr- pr- that's, that's, that's a tough one for you to swallow. <laughs> that pr- it's tough. No, I think the, the, you can do, we talk about the probables. Is if, you're, if you're looking at a win bet, take a look at the will pays. They're, uh, the double will pays are a huge clue as to uh, as to what's possibly going to happen um, as they pop. You know, the computers will come at the last second and make those wagers that uh, reflect what the, the will pays are already telling you 10 minutes before pop. Bruno, French Quarter is poked ahead in front of your horse down on the rail. And, and I don't know if you and I actually dove into it. I was just making a comment about last week. And I'm not going to sit here and say definitively anything right now. Last week when the slop showed up at Gulfstream, you were down on the rail. You were in serious, serious deep water, no pun intended. Um, the three looks like he's home and hosed right now. He's not changing. He didn't change the last time out either. That's why I didn't like him in spot, especially going longer. But he's going to get the job done pretty comfortably. It looks like you should hang on for second here seven to two so place shouldn't be should be too too bad no, 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 beating the favorite there yeah beating the favorite yeah, maybe, there maybe get four or five bucks yeah absolutely you know it, you know the the sloppy racetracks are interesting um you know there's uh there's a lot of things that can happen you know i've, I've heard a lot of riders talk about it and i've seen it happen where they'll try to ride the uh, tractor the tractor tire marks where the tractors go that that ground is a little bit more compacted and so obviously the horses travel over it better um the 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 moisture can move the surface around and can can cause issues in terms of of what part is a deeper part of the racetrack so bias like you mentioned um can come into play sometimes the rail gets good when it gets wet down at fairgrounds historically the rail's great good speaking of uh biases and things of that nature I'll go back to last week. We had chatted about some horses possibly for the turf stake that War of Will ended up scratching out of. And Halliday went out there and looked pretty impressive when he went out there and got the job done. 
I mentioned that I, I was interested in aquaphobia, and this has nothing necessarily to do with last week's race, but it's another sort of angle to, to use and, and keep in your back pocket that I don't think enough people pay attention to. The idea of on the grass, when they take the rails down, especially at the fairgrounds, if you want to go back and take a look at that Mervyn Muniz, there is a there is a line. You can see the difference in the color of the turf down on the rail as opposed to the turf that was probably four paths off the rail where they had been running for weeks and weeks and weeks. And you get that fresh grass. I can't say it enough. And so many people have brought it up too, especially at Saratoga, where you go through the summer and all of a sudden they take the rails down and it can become a highway down on the inside. And I think that's something that I don't want to say not enough people pay attention to, but it's it's something I would at least encourage folks to keep an eye on going forward. You're on mute. Is he back now? Is he frozen up on me? That's all right. There he is. He's, he's, he's solo. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, we'll take my, it. I think my, oh, he's back. Something went on my computer. He's not for a second. It's all good. So we've got uh, seven to two over seven to two in the ninth down at Gulfstream. Uh, again, like Jonathan said, kind of a pivotal moment here in this thing because it's the right smack dab in the middle. We've got seven races. This is going to be the fourth one, Colin, at the halfway point. Before that race goes official, Craig, if we could throw up the leaderboard, we'll just kind of run down people. This is prior to the ending of this most recent run at Gulfstream Park. We'll take a look again. The top 15 people get in to next Friday's Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge qualifier that we'll go over here on Horse Players. Um, and on um, Breeders' Cup, obviously, as far as the Facebook and Periscope is concerned. Uh, you can take a look. You've got uh, your bubble at this point happens to be our friend Naomi Tucker in the midst of a four-way tie coming into that race. All of them at $44, along with Alistair Walbaum, uh, Gregory Lewis, and Jen Pollock. And there's a pretty, I don't want to call it a giant gap, but there's a pretty healthy gap between 16th, which is, again, the tied point for the cutoff leading into this race, and everyone else. There was about a, let's call it, what? Almost twenty dollars, called seventeen bucks if you want to include the change difference. So the top sixteen, it's a pretty healthy separation with four races to go. We'll see what happens now when this race is now official kind of Gulfstream three ten one two. Relatively chalky if you're just playing it from a from a gambling standpoint individually, but seven to two over seven to two. So that might shake things up a slight bit here in a spot like this. I think maybe we've got JK back at this point. TBD. Yeah, Jonathan? I faked. Uh yeah, yeah. What happened is I faked, um, I faked technical dif difficulties so that I could get a beer. I don't hate that. I'm just kidding. I really didn't. Something happened. Like my computer, like just like turned off. I don't hate but that. I'm That's all right. We're back. <laughs> yeah, my my display, my display turned off. But um, but I'm back in action, and I got a beer while I was rebooting. So how did you, you get it, or did Austin get it for you? No, I, I didn't have the courage. I thought yes. about it. <laughs> I just didn't want to be judged. I mean, I don't see anything wrong with it. <sighs> Here we go. Updated leaderboard. All right. As far as this qualifier is concerned, we've still got three races to go. Plenty of time. If you're out of it, we see our friend there, Drew Coatney. He's tied for fifth right now, feeling pretty good. But uh, Billy Bulch is tied for the lead with Kevin Dugan or Duggan at uh, $70. Then William Arts is in third. With 65.20, Andrew Chung is tied with th two others, uh, along with Drew Coatney and Brent Pollock. $61 there in a bit of a tie. But keep in mind, Andrew Chung is actually solo four because of the tiebreaker that we mentioned with the show places. Uh, you've got the seven, or the individual that's in seventh right now. I'm going to screw this name up tremendously. Crescenzio Daka, Daka Nan. Sorry if I uh, butchered that too, too badly. Lucas Van Zant's in eighth. Craig uh, West Husing is in ninth. Gregory Lewis is in tenth. Uh, Brian uh, Mustafa is in eleventh. They're tied with Bruce Meyer. The thirteenth right now is Mike Langhorn. Fourteenth is Alistair Walbaum by himself. Fifteenth uh, is Naomi Tucker. She is on the bubble right now with forty-four dollars. And then Jen Pollock. Again, I I'm sure it just boils down to the show placings for the folks that are in fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth to separate them individually. Then you've got about a call it a eleven and a half, twelve dollar sort of gap between the sixteenth place and seventeen. We have a tie right now. Mark Windland, along with our buddy. The Million Dollar Man, Michael Baychock, at $31.40. How are you feeling? What do you have for these last three races? Are you feeling like you're – where are you positioned? I don't even know. I have uh, – I've got $4.80. Okay. Um, so I'm not doing well. I mean, I don't, I, I'm yeah, not I'm doing four, much better. I'm, I'm at $12.20. So. Yeah, so I have the I have the one at Santa, which I'm sure is probably short because 
It was 8-1 to one one. morning line, though. 7-1? to 7-1 to one right now. There you go. I'm back in the game. I got up in smoke, and then okay. I have uh, I have two horses in the last. It, 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 it's Santa. The, well, the last, the sixth, the nine, and the two. So um, if I go runner, runner here, if I hit Heather's Gray, the one, and I hit up in smoke, I'm, I think I'm right there. I think I'm right there. Now I'm trying to take a look and see what we've got for odds right now at Gulfstream. I'm a little bit surprised that Tonal Shape is as heavy a horse. And again, I, we've got to take a look and you brought it up and it's it, it's a tool that I think people need to be paying attention to the wheel pays. You know, you can look at the, the probables leading into the next race, but especially for a spot like this with the doubles where, and you got to be careful where you're doing it. You do it at some smaller tracks where the handle isn't quite as strong as a Gulfstream or a Santa Anita or a New York. Um, it can be, a, it can get a little bit choppy from time to time, yeah. but for a place like this, the double will pay is going to be pretty accurate as far as kind of projecting forward what the off odds are going to be. And I haven't taken a look yet, but for Tonal the Shape to be one to two, I don't know that she necessarily deserves that in a field like this. She can no, win. I don't. I don't think so either. I mean, obviously, yeah, for sure, she can win. But obviously, my you know my heart is somewhere else. But I'll, I've never been a huge fan of Tonal Shape. I've tried to beat her uh, her last two or three times. I've just never. She's just never really kind of you know got me going. Um, uh, so yeah, I think it's entirely too short. But I also think she'll drift up a little bit. I think the three to five is a little bit early, like you talked about. And so I, I uh, I'd imagine she'll come up uh, in price a little bit there. So you have Heather's Gray in here, the one. I have the four horse in this spot, Arctic Roll. There's a part of me that just looked at it, and I know this horse has been beaten at this level a number of times. She's a five-year-old mare, but I, I just I like that she has a little bit of tactical speed and she can sit close to the pace without absolutely needing it. She's shown that she can pass in the past, and I think it is important to identify you've got a number of horses in here that technically are eligible for N2L that have only won run, one race in their career. And I get it. Maybe they're recent maiden winners and they're trying, you know, winners for the first time. And rather than risk them for a tag or whatever the case may be, they're going to just kind of go up the ladder. There, I think there's something to be said about horses that have multiple wins in a condition like this. And that, you know, both of our horses fit that bill at seven and nine to one. Yeah. You, um, you know, that's the, th I've been trying to get much better about conditions, you know, evaluating conditions and really understanding why horses are in the spots that are uh, the th Gray that really got me going. It's something that's that's really uh, been a kind of a default for me. I can find horses that are tactical on the rail. I don't want slow plotter types on the rail. Tactical horses on the rail end up getting good trips and they save ground, which is obviously extremely important uh, in in, uh, in turf racing. So I just felt like she was going to get a great trip down on the inside, um, and uh, she had won off a layoff in the past. So I, I felt like that made a little bit of sense. The, the horse that I had a really difficult time deciding what I was interested in was the two. And I'm curious if you have any opinion lost in translation who, you know, uh, no, I'm not throwing shade at any morning lines. Horse was five to one. This is a tough race to make a morning line for, but this is a horse that I felt needed the lead to be at her best. And I don't know if this distance is necessarily what she wants. They tried to stretch her out. I feel like there've been a number of different things at 17 to one. If I were just gambling, you know, maybe I wouldn't be afraid to throw a few bucks on, but I just, was the one of the horses anyway that I was looking at saying, you know, on, on her best day, she's every bit as fast as some of these horses. I just, I'm a little bit leery about the distance. Yeah, you know, the thing, the distance is, is obviously a concern. Uh, the thing that kind of throws me off the most is uh, uh, the trainer. Um, okay. I, I, mean, I mean, has he ever had a start? Uh, not listed anyway, and I'm sure I haven't gone back and, and done anything. Yeah, of I mean, I looked at two the PPs and he's, he's 0 for 0. He's 0 for 0 in his life. Off of Baltus, who's a very high percentage trainer, mm -hmm. that that uh, I, I just that's a move I'm willing to take a chance to find out if this guy the next Bobby Franklin or Chad Brown. <laughs> I, I just he, he's never done it, and so um, you know I, I I'll uh, I'll wait and see. You know we were talking about the uh, the double wheel pays, and now I've got a chance to take a look. Um, for a dollar, you're looking at. Tonal is shape at about nine bucks. And the second choice by a pretty healthy margin is going to be up in smoke. And, and that's a $24 double for a buck. So tonal is shape at three to five and up in smoke at two and a half to one. That might not change a ton. Maybe tonal is shape floats up a little bit, but I can't imagine her going above even money. And if that's the yeah. case, up in smoke probably lands in that two to one, five to two range. Well, this is one of those situations where you, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to see this, this idea in uh they're off at saying anita but if you want to see this idea at work essentially what that is saying is that 
uh, up in smoke is going to be three times the price of toneless shape so let the let the betting come in let it shift let it move around and uh you know check that match at the end when, when they announce it and and like i said it's it's a difficult i don't want to say it's a, a dangerous trap i think there's value to it but you have to be cognizant of where you're paying attention to that sort of thing because at some of the shorter sort of i don't want to say shorter but smaller tracks that have less handle but that can be a bit of, a, a bit of an anomaly how do you feel right now you're pushing 22 in a piece and you got down to well, your boy's not scared of 22 in a piece i'm concerned about how i went from seven to one to three to one i mean you want to talk about a late hammer drop so this is going to be twice today my Just horse went trip. seven down to three and a half and you're in a good position right now but you you lost more than half of your your golfer you you have to you have to imagine how that turf is oh, yeah. all right lush i mean look this horse on the front's got the ears pricked drake trying to get the four rolling in third you're sitting in second you still got a big chance in here i guess it depends if the front horse is going to stop on us they're just not stopping they're fine. Yeah. Ooh, but the on the outside is making a big move at the end. Who's down on the rail? The tens trying three eleven. I want to say. So Ellie Arroway, it looked anyway. Adler and Ronis racing, coming off of a little bit of a layoff again. Most of these horses in California, off of a little bit of a vacation, stretching back out in distance. And you know, you take a look at that final time, and again, these are these are solid horses. I mean, we're not looking at bottom level claimers or anything like that. The final time of 34 and one for a mile. I'd be very curious to see how the turf continues to play for the reason you alluded to. You want to talk about pristine? You're probably never going to see the turf in as good a condition as you're seeing it right now, whether that's at Santa Anita, whether that's at Golden Gate, uh, any of these places that would have been running pretty consistently throughout. Right, I bet you Churchill's is going to be pretty beautiful tomorrow oh. as well. That that uh, you know that that uh, that turf course is would have already been you know they've already seen it would already have seen some action at this point uh, for about three or four weeks. So so um, this, now this was also a question that I was going to ask you before we we came on, and I you know felt like it was a good one to kind of put a pin in with a with a meet like Churchill opening up tomorrow or Santa Anita and Golden Gate coming off of layoffs or basically any track doesn't matter where it is coming off of a, a lengthy time away. Are you willing to just dive right in on day one and say, you know, I'm used, I know what the track does. I've paid enough attention in the past. It's going to probably play relatively close. Or, I mean, I'll admit I get a little bit scared early on until I get to see what the tracks are doing before I really want to say I'm diving in deep saying, because I, I have no idea. If, if all of a sudden we find out that the grass is a conveyor belt at Santa Anita on day one, I, I don't know that I would have just naturally predicted that to be the case. I can I can watch Saratoga for 39 days and on the 40th <laughs> get my doors blown off. So, you know, doesn't make a difference. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, look, I understand what you're saying. There's obviously some comfort with kind of having an idea of how everything's playing, but I also think there's some opportunity as well because you have horses that are shipping in, you have horses that are making, uh, you know, first starts. You've got trainers that could be cold or not. You've got new riders coming in. You know, at Churchill tomorrow, you got Javier, Johnny, Joel, Ricardo. Uh, Manny, they're all in one place. So, the, you know, there's going to be some interesting things there. Who's on, who's on who Chad Brown's st starting a horse there that he probably would be normally starting at Belmont at this point. You've got, so there's so many different uh, variables that I think there probably is actually some opportunity. So, um, you know, I, I'm not going to be making a, a breeder's cup esque dive into tomorrow at Churchill, but I will be firing away at, at, uh, at a meet that I think is going to be an absolute battle. I think it's going to be a phenomenal meet uh, with the riders that I had mentioned that are going to be there. Obviously we're, we're, uh, we're all hoping that New York racing gets going as fast as they possibly can. And uh, until then, I think Churchill is going to be a, a heck of a meet. Well, and, and obviously, like you say, we throw that kind of caveat out there. We'll see what happens with New York. Hopefully it's sooner than later, whether it's Belmont or getting into Saratoga or where, whatever it ends up being. Um, but I, I don't think it's out of, I don't think it's out of left field to say that this Churchill meet is shaping up to look like Saratoga Jr. I mean, as far as the riders that are in town, the connections that are in town, it, it, it has the potential to really be, I'm not throwing shade at any other place that's running right now. I mean, it's got the potential to be the best meet that we've seen so far in 2020. You know, Churchill, Churchill's meet was, was, uh, was unbelievable last year. You know, and they kind of had the the purse hike, and and I I got to be honest, as a as a person who's not a horseman, 
I haven't really even looked to see what the purse situation is now, considering the the state of the world. I wouldn't be surprised if they if they pulled back a little bit, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they left it like it was. So I don't know. I'm just saying I haven't looked, mm -hmm. but I would imagine that it's going to be uh, an, an unbelievable meet. I mean, you know, I, I they got they had to pull out the green and yellow uh, saddle uh, towel, the 18, uh, a couple times tomorrow. So you know, you know that's pretty impressive. In fact, uh, there's actually an American Pharaoh baby that's in the 18 hole wearing the 18 that American Pharaoh one. So that okay. could be a, a hunch play if you're a hunch player. I was going to say, yeah, if you're if you're one of those folks that uh, <laughs> you like to just kind of sit on it and say there's a reason for things. Yeah, um, yeah, there, there could be something there, and you know, and and that's just to say, and don't get me wrong, Oakland had a phenomenal meet. Their their meet was great, but Oakland's it's just it's different because of a couple things. One, they don't have turf racing. So that's obviously uh, it throws a different dynamic into it. The other thing is that, um, you know, uh, Arkansas has the Arkansas bread program that, that that is not something that all of us are accustomed to looking at, not familiar with all their stallions, their mares, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, and then also they only have like three distances. You know, yeah. there's a horse I like tomorrow for Tom Amos. I know Tom claimed the horse, liked the horse wanted to stretch the horse out. But if you, if you claim a horse for six at Oakland and you want to stretch him out, that's two turns, buddy. <laughs> you know, there's no other option. And the horse ran well. And now he's back in for seven, uh, seven furlongs tomorrow, which is probably the stretch out. I'd imagine Tom really wanted in, in, in uh, you know, the first time. Let's take a look. We've got an updated leaderboard. Kevin Duggan right now is uh, setting the pace at $85 80 cents. Again, the top 15 are going to get into next Friday's, BCBC BC qualifier here for our uh, horse players happy hour in the afternoon. Uh, William Arts is in second right now at seventy forty. Billy uh, Balch is in third at seventy dollars. Uh, Crescenzio Dakayanan uh, again. I, I apologize in, in advance if I butcher your name. Uh, sitting fourth right now. Solo sixty nine forty. Brian Mustafa is in fifth. Andrew Chung is in sixth. We have a tie for seventh. Uh, our friend Drew Cotney, along with uh, Brett Pollock, they're at sixty-one dollars even. Naomi Tucky, uh, Naomi Tucker, excuse me, another one of our friends. She's here at fifty-nine eighty. Lucas Van Sant's at fifty-three sixty. Craig Westazing is at fifty eighty. Uh, Gregory Lewis is at forty-eight eighty. Bruce Myers at forty-eight twenty. Uh, we've got a tie for fourteenth. Mark Winland and Michael Baychock at, at forty-seven twenty. Sixteenth. So currently, the bubble boy is Mike Langthorne. At forty six sixty, and then you've got a number of uh, a number of horses. I just am so conditioned to say that. You've got a number of people <laughs> that are in that next wave in the the low forty, high thirty range. And uh, with two to go, you're still very live if you're involved in that piece. And who knows if you're someone that has some bombs in these next two races? You know, if you connect and you go uh, for the term that you use from a poker standpoint, if you go runner runner, or uh, the way that uh, I remember saying it one time to Lee Davis, if you just go cold double. Cold double to wrap things up. You're going to be all right. So uh, we'll see what happens here. you got three minutes to post at Gulfstream. Plenty, plenty of time. Um, there was something else that I was trying to I'm trying to remember now. From well, a, I'm going to make yeah. a point while you, while you think oh, of that, yeah. while you're thinking about that. Uh, I, I saw a name on that leaderboard that I got to give a shout out to. There's a guy on that leaderboard that used to put me in my place on a regular basis and head-to-heads. I'd play because I love playing the head to heads on horse players and uh, horse tourneys, excuse me. And, and, uh, and man, I, I would get into games with this guy, Lucas Van Zant, and he would whip me every time. And finally, I was just like, I'm not playing him anymore. I'm just not going to play him anymore. There's a lot of people on there. I think some people are scared of playing head to heads with. I don't care. I'll play him. Uh, you know, there's a guy named Travis Pearson who plays a lot. He's always, if you want to get in a game, he's always sitting there waiting. I'll play Travis Pearson, but Lucas Van Zant, I'm taking my ball and going home. <laughs> it's one of those things too. I mean, like you were alluding to, um, and I believe his name is James Lasowski. Uh, I had mentioned to you last week, I played in uh, horse tourneys has now developed these um, occasionally these five person contests where the winner takes all the buy-in is like $230, something like that. So the winner ends up walking out with a thousand bucks and three days in a row, I ran second and I'm just bashing my head off the wall. And I'm like, and twice, it was James Lasowski, and I had to put out the tweet. I said, look, he's taking my lunch money fair and square two days in a row. I mean, it should be two grand in my pocket. And instead, <laughs> he's walking around saying, you know, I, I'm the king. And I and he responded, and it was a really nice uh, comment that he made. And I think, it, again, if you're not familiar with contests or tournaments, 
there are so many ways for you to kind of break into it. You don't have to dive into the deep end right away. Right. This this format right here, this is a great way for you to kind of cut your teeth and figure things out. But Horse Attorneys offers a number of opportunities, whether it's head-to-heads, whether it's, you know, um, like I said, these small five-person contests. They'll offer some where it's only available to people that have deposited $100 or less over the past year, kind of that right. intro sort of level. So there's so many different ways for you to get involved if you're new to it. My favorite thing to do, uh, um, of I've I've been fortunate enough to 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 be on like the NHC um, NTRA NHC like mentor program. People that want to get involved in contests, they want to just talk to someone who plays, and and so we'll I'll set up calls and I'll talk to people. And the, the advice I always give them if you're going to start playing online, especially if you're trying to qualify for the Breeders' Cup or for the NHC, if you're going to play in a twenty-four dollar Breeders' Cup feeder, an eighteen dollar NHC feeder, I encourage you to. Find a head-to-head -head that's that exact same price point and play them both with the same races. Because the idea is, is that you're, you have a great chance of being better than that one person that could potentially make it a free roll for your attempt to feed into the other one. It's one of my favorite things I used to, I used to do it all the time. I'm not playing as much online like into feeding, you know. Um, I found that I'm better off just playing. But um, – but if it's a great way to kind of to churn and to, to get experience. I also think it's a great way to get a full day's action. If you are not in position, to load up the ADW with 500 and fire away. You can play in a hundred dollar head to head or a $50 head to head. You have a full day of action. You know, you can watch every race with interest. And, uh, and so, I mean, I love playing those. It's a lot of fun. I've said to my friends, some of them, you know, kind of the, sort of genesis of them getting introduced to the game and all that stuff was Saratoga. And we would always, every year, even before the the reality show happened and, and everything else happened, um, we would go up for Travers Day. And my buddies who don't know a horse's head from a horse's rear end would be like, what are we doing? And I would say, you know, offer them up a couple things. And then I'd pick like four losers in a row. And they'd be like, why are you telling us we can do this on our own? And I said, that's fine. Totally. I get it. It's fine. It's all good. But I also have brought up this sort of concept to them where, you know, I have some friends that are full blown degenerates that will bet on cockroaches in the building in New York City. Or or I have friends that, you know, if they had to part with ten dollars, they're beside themselves. And I said, a, a contest is a good way for you for the reason that you alluded to. Let's say I'll just use Tampa as the example from earlier today because I tried to get into a late head to head. It didn't fill. I ended up playing in the, the 10K and it's not going great. But the point is. I was going to have that $218 worth of action for the day. And it wouldn't have been necessarily, and I said it to you last week. I said, I think one of the other things too, that's so good about the head to heads, you don't have to have brilliant opinions. You just need to be right more than the person that you're playing. Now look, on some days, that's going to be a heck of a lot easier than other days, but you don't have to sit there and turn a hundred into a thousand. You can sit there and say, I picked three winners. The highest price of the three was 10 bucks. I walked out with a total of, you know, making it up $39 or $40, and that might be enough to win. And oh, I, I want, I want that, a head to head like $13 to 6 the other day. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and guess what? That You play enough, that's going to happen where it's going to be. I've oh. uh, tweeted about it like two weeks ago. I said, I'm in the midst of a rock fight. Oh, where yeah. We're just sitting there. It, it was it was one of those. It was like $10 to 420 and I lost. And I was like, yeah. well, you know, I deserve to lose for $4.20. But yeah, but it's, it's fun, man. It's, you know, it's, uh, it, look, I, I think that any time that you can go out, you know, look, I think that there's you know, basketball players, professional basketball players, they'll go and they'll shoot free throws for a day, or they'll just go and go and do right-handed layups or left-handed layups, or they'll go to the gym and they'll just shoot with their left hand for the day, or they'll just go and dribble and not even shoot, or, or you know, or they'll go and, you know, pass it off the, the, the net, whatever they do off the back, whatever, you can, whatever you can come up with. I think that pass it any, off the net. well, I'm, you know, I'm talking about that like net I, yeah, square yeah, yeah. thing, no, whatever that thing is about, it passes it back to you. Yeah. I just didn't know the name of that deal. It I called it a pitch back when I was uh, playing there baseball. When I was That's what up. I should have said, yeah. pitch back. Um, there's a lot of different exercises that you can do as a horse player to broaden your scope. I, I've told people before, um, you know, I know it's a joke and, and I don't mind the joke it is of my, you know, my affinity for picking favorites. I, I you know, I, the, the, the chalk eating, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And, and that's true. I do. I, I do. My brain sees horses like that easier. That's just how my brain works. I'm an optimistic person. I'm not a pessimistic person. So I, it's hard for me to envision 
a negative scenario in which the best horse loses. Sometimes my brain just can't see it. But what I learned in contests, playing in these like head to head, these two dollar win places, is I I you you're forced to play longer priced horses in these contests. And this is where I learned that I had the ability to do it. I used to not think I could find a 10 to one shot. Like, I can't find a 10 to one shot ever, never. But then you'll have those moments where you find a 10 to one and it wins. And you're like, wow, I can't find a yeah. 10 to one shot. And next thing you know, you're using that 10 to one shot as an a horse in your pick four, you know, and you're hitting it and you're now you've got a $20,000 pick five score that you wouldn't have had before. And so it, it's not just the competition. The camaraderie is off is obviously awesome in these contests, but man, it's, it's a, uh, it, it's really, you know, helping you kind of develop another stroke and, and another, you know, get another club in your bag, if, if you will, if that's not, if I didn't butcher that uh, golf analogy. No, no that, that was perfect. And kind of to that point, you know, I mean, I, I cut my teeth. I, I didn't grow up with the game. I didn't grow up playing. I feel like you played more on like a, I don't want to say a day to day basis prior to the contest scene. So I do feel like there is a major differentiating factor of like how you grew up playing or how you first learned how to play. I was much more on the contest side than the day to day, you know, win, play, show, pick four or whatever it may have been, because I felt like I was conditioned to try to poke holes in the favorite because this sort of format rewards that as opposed to on a day to day basis. If I love a two to one shot, there's nothing wrong with hammering the two to one shot if you think they're just the best horse in the race. Yeah, or singling or whatever. So, um, I had to bring out the I had to bring out the uh, the boss. He's a a big fan of Jake Ballas, so we had to come watch uh, the big Phil. You gonna say hi, bud? Hi. They can't see you. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Austin making a guest appearance here. All right, so yeah, he I mean, wants to come thoughts. watch. He wants to watch Jake. So your thoughts, not just because it's all about the break for me. I was gonna. So, are you? Is there any concern if she runs or, or starts off similarly to the way that she has in her sprint races? Yeah, I don't want her falling way out of it. The, the track actually looks a little bit drier than it did earlier. They've it? upgraded it to good, and it, look, it. I would venture a guess with some of the kickback looks like that's pretty darn close to fast. She broke great. Go on with her, Louis. So you know, you have her obviously in the contest. I have Cheermeister. Uh, I'm just trying to wing it on the front, and it was. It's look. I think that's the other thing. You got to separate heart from you know gambling and things of that nature. I'm not suggesting she can't win. I just figured she was going to get back. Oh, of course, of course, yeah, yeah, of course. No, no, not at all. I mean, I don't love where she's at. I wish she would have been a little bit closer. I wish she was in the spot that Tone was. Shit was. But it's not it's not drastic, you know. She's um she's just kind of doing what she does. She she has to kind of be encouraged at the part of the race. They're not going very fast. That's obviously an obstacle when you're hoping that you're going to buy some horse late. But look, here's the great about here's the great news. And I, I do this in the middle of races. I try to like start setting myself up. She's sitting one length off of the one to two shot. Mm -hmm. So if that horse wins, she has every right to win. Um. Seems like Louie's encouraging her a little bit, and she's responding. You're going to say, and guess what? This field all of a sudden just got really, really tight because the pace setters just, I don't want to say dropped anchor, but they're not going to kick on with it. Um, tonal is, you know, I mean, if we're being frank, looking okay, but Rad's trying to push it along. Here comes Pleasant Orb. Pleasant Orb is my backup. I'll be so upset if she wins 20 to 1. Um, but look, Up and Smoke's trying, and this is where her runs have come in those short races. We'll find out about the two turns. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, she's, it's not going to happen today, and I, I'm not necessarily sure it was the two turns. Um, she just didn't get away it again. So Tonal Shape gets the job done at one to two. So if you were a fan of the horse or you had the horse, not much damage there um, toward the top of the, the leaderboard anyway. Uh, our friend, Shona Rosenblum, all threes, another winner. <laughs> she's trying to take this thing. She did the same great. thing last week with the fours, I think. But so I will this say this though: just uh, Shona is a Shona Shona's, is a, people that want to make fun. Yeah. If you want to make fun of her picking for all the threes, mm -hmm. she's qualified for the NHC more than you have, and she was handicapping the day she qualified. So Shona's no uh, joke. She just popped Shona's in no the threes. Joke. I did. I do that all the time. <laughs> I'll never forget last year at uh, Saratoga. At one point, I don't know if it was the last day of the meet or the day before. The, you know, one of those on Labor Day weekend. 
she was like, oh, yeah, you know, we played uh, this pick four and it came back uh, 19,000 or whatever it was. And I was like, <laughs> just casually are saying that. She's like, yeah, yeah no big deal. <laughs> I was like, geez. No, I wish I could just a... say casually, you know, yeah. 20 grand, no big deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So tonal, tonal shape gets the job done. Um, I'll be honest with you, tonal shape. You, you mentioned it. You never really loved her. I've never been a huge fan of the horse. Um, I hated the Gulfstream Oaks as a whole. And then uh, Swiss Sky Tiver comes back and runs a hole in the wind down at Oaklawn. I still don't know what to make of that race because her and Venetian Harbor, and I'm not just saying this because I've got skin in the game and I didn't love the ride that she dares the devil got, but that's neither here nor there. I don't know if those Phillies were like literally 15 lengths faster than the rest of the field. And uh, what does that mean going forward? Because again, it's, it's the difference in this year, not only from the Oaks, but from the Derby standpoint, I mean, there was eons in horse racing to go between now and the big goal. If you're talking about that, the first Friday and Saturday in September. Oh, for sure. I mean, obviously uh, the, the, the two of the biggest to me, at least in my mind, well, one, no one will disagree with one. Maybe some people will, the two biggest three-year-old races, the three biggest three-year-old races to me are the acorn, the test and the Oaks. Those are the three-year-old mm. Philly races that, that move me the most. The ones that I find to be the most, uh, you know, uh, I, I think they probably add the most value from a brood pair, brood mare standpoint. Um, I mean, obviously Alabama is what it yeah. is, but Alabama is running a mile and a quarter. And so it, it that all, it just, it doesn't, it kind of brings in a, a different animal into the, into the equation. So uh, those three races I think are, are, are huge. And, and we don't know what's going to happen with, with, uh, with obviously with the acorn, you'd imagine that it'll get run whenever the Belmont gets run. Um, and you know, horses like Venetian Harbor and Swiss Skydiver, and, and even a Philly like this, toneless shape. Um, I, I would imagine those are races that they'll all be pointing towards. And I think that could be a, a really good addition to that race, that one turn mile. Uh, but you're right. It's it, the Kentucky Oaks is a long time from now, a long time from now. I would, I would say there's, you know, and I've, I've understand a number of people that, you know, not to get into the, the politics and things of that nature. But I know a lot of people are really upset about the idea of future wagers. If you bet through a place like Twin Spires or whatever it may be, I have future wagers through someone. I, I won't name names, but the idea is, I guess the flip side is it, like, let's just use one of the horses that perhaps was highly fancied early on. And maybe late on, they threw in a bit of a dud. And in any other year, it's over. Like they gambled and they lost. The connections tried to take that last shot, get their points, be ready to go for the first Friday or Saturday in May. For whatever reason, that may or may not have worked this time around. The good news is you get a bit of a, a bit of a mulligan. And on the flip side, I said this the other day on my podcast. I don't know if a lot of people would agree or disagree with it, but I'm also I would venture to say that the Oaks and the Derby this year, regardless of how many run in those two races they're going to be better races than they would be in May from a quality standpoint, because you think about it, let's go back to 2016. I mean, there's no question from a, from a male standpoint, there was one horse that would have won the Kentucky Derby. I mean, Arrogate would have won by a hundred. And that was a year with a horse like gun runner. That was with who was at good at the time, American freedom. I mean, there were, there were a lot of really talented runners. Arrogate would have won the Derby any other year. He's not even involved. And I get it. If you want to say maybe that dilutes the Derby itself, but to me, it just feels like it's a unique circumstance. And I don't know that that necessarily has to be viewed as a, as a bad thing or as a negative. So if you have future wagers on horses that you planned on, you know, the first Friday or Saturday in May, and it's not going to pan out or whatever it may be, that may actually be a blessing in disguise. Yeah. You know, Pete and I talked about this a few times on the podcast. We actually had an episode. It was an impromptu episode. We just kind of did it where we went through like the last three or four derbies. And we looked at the field and we said, if this race was won run in September, would someone else have won? Um, you know, look, there's obviously injuries come into play, and it, it's not a, it's not the, it's not the most exact science, uh, you know, when you when you're trying to figure all that out. But it was an interesting, you know, exercise, and I encourage people to do it themselves as well. But you're right about Arrogate. So, um, the the Derby is special because it's run in the first Saturday in May early it's the first time that these horses will be running a mile and a quarter or longer and it's the first time for us to find out how good they really are and so you know i think that it's important to to realize that a lot of that will be will be lost right 
it's going to be late. So, you know, it's not going to be the first time that every horse in the race has run a mile and a quarter because the Travers will have happened before that. Uh, the Preakness, we don't know when that's going to happen. If it, if it happens before, that's a mile and three sixteenths. Same idea. The Belmont happens before mile and a half if they run it a mile and a half. So it loses a lot of its luster in that regard. It's still the first Saturday in you know September. It's still the Kentucky Derby, the Run for the Roses. It'll still be a big race, but it won't be the same. Do you think? I mean, I know you guys have touched on it a little bit. Do you think there's going to be any long term ramifications of whoever wins the Oaks and the Derby this year? As far as you know, will people look back on them and you think there'll be an asterisk and they'll say, "Well, yeah, but you didn't you didn't win it the way that it's been won for a hundred and forty years." Or- whatever it is no not the derby i think the only asterisk would that would come is if someone won the triple crown if someone won the belmont the derby and the preakness it wouldn't have the same feel because it didn't happen in a five-week span it didn't happen early in the three-year-old year or in the first half of the three-year-old year it didn't happen with two weeks between the derby and the preakness and then coming back to the belmont in three i mean there's a lot that, you know you didn't overcome a 20 well i don't know i mean i guess the derby will still have 20 horses i don't know i mean I'll be, I got to be honest. I'll be I'll be stunned if there aren't twenty horses running. And I, I understand a lot of people have talked about war of attrition and things like that. If I just happen to stumble into a slot, I mean the horse is probably a long shot anyway. I'm going to run. Yeah. They, I, I mean, they, I they wouldn't. I don't think they would do it. But I do think that they should go ahead and say they're not allowing maidens. Oh, agreed. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying if I had points. Let's no, say but I. I would, but I'm just saying if, if there's seventeen horses or fourteen horses. I could see a bunch of people who have, who have maidens just saying like, dang, I want to get that little, you know, the bin, the, the, the gift, the gift bag. <laughs> Yo, for sure. I mean, look, that's, that's part of it. You want to be involved in the party. I've talked about it that, you know, some of these connections, they, they probably realize going into the day, like it's It's going to take a shooting star for us to win this race, but we're here and let's enjoy the party. And, and I don't, I don't begrudge people that are involved for that reason. If you want to get involved, I get it. Like you can sit there and say for the rest of your life, I had a horse that ran in the Kentucky Derby. Don't have to tell them that their horse ran 19th, but you know, I had yeah, a horse that in September. Ran. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's right. That's that's even you want to talk about the ultimate sort of kick in the head where it's one thing if you're like, oh yeah, I had a horse that ran in the Derby. They didn't run well, and they were actually you know down the road they were a little bit more mature. They still weren't any good. Neither here nor there. I don't. I'm not. We're not throwing shade at people. Uh, zero minutes to post for the last race of this contest. Uh, Producer Craig had just thrown up the leaderboard. You can find it over on horseplayers.com. Uh, we're here at the bitter end, and I've got a question that I don't think has come up. Maybe it has in all these. I, they're all kind of blending together, but it, they're my favorite part of the week, these Fridays. The idea that maybe not for a contest like this, because the stakes, you're looking at $179 buy-in in the next Friday's contest. But let's say you're in a position. Let's say this was a BCBC qualifier, and let's say you're, let's say you're the leader. Let's say you're Kevin Dugan, who has the eight horse here at eight to one. So he's got he's got a horse that he's trying to you know the good news is you run second you're going to get a nice place price whatever the case may be. Are you someone that'll hedge in a spot like this, or do you just kind of say let the chips fall where they may? I'm not much of a hedger. Um, okay. I learned a lesson at a young age. Uh, it's probably not safe for this broadcast, but mm-hmm. you might be, maybe you've heard me say it before, and I'll tell you. But I Lynch, I mean, I'll give you the basic ideas. I I called a, an old mentor of mine. I was alive for a huge pick four score at a, at an a, at an age and at a time when that was like very. It wasn't just more money that I was going to be able to participate with. It was money that I like I needed for like life, start life. And um, I I said, look, I, I didn't use the favorite. You know, should I hedge? And he asked me, did you like the horse when you woke up in the morning? And I said, no. And then in an interesting way, he told me not to hedge. So I've just kind of stuck with that to a certain extent. I feel like if you if you hedge 10 times and you add up all those 10 times, you can think about all the money that you gave away by doing that hedge um, on the times that you did win. Um, I try to stick to my opinion. Now, am I going to fault someone or do I think that it's mathematically flawed that if you are alive uh, for a $10,000 seat and a pick and pray and you have the eight and the only other horse that can that can beat you out of the 10,000 is the nine, then yeah, you bet, you know, 2,000 on the nine for mental insurance. But then yeah. you're turning your $10,000 score into an $8,000 score. Right. So are you going to feel good about that afterwards when you hated the nine and the nine runs up the track? Are you going to be, is that going to frustrate you? It would drive me nuts. So you just have to decide what your, 
so many of these questions go back to what is your betting personality and what are your goals? There's no right or wrong answer. There's, there's zero right or wrong answer in this game when it comes to how you approach it. It's more about what's your, you know, what's your betting personality and your goals. Because the thing about it is I think you and I have a, so many similar principles when it comes to our, the way we look at racing, the way we look at betting, the way we look at strategy, the way we look at ticket construction. But I would imagine that we will we'll never have similar tickets because your betting personality and your goals are different than my betting personality and my goals. Neither one of us are right and neither one of us are wrong, but it leads you down different paths. And so the, the hedge question is, I would say to someone, well, I mean, are you going to be mad if you get beat? Cause I'm going to be mad if I get beat, but I can handle it. So I'll just let it ride. But some people can't. Yeah. And the only thing I would add to that, because I, I tend to agree with you. I think, I think there becomes a threshold of what's on the line and what you could potentially feel like you lost out on. So, excuse me, as they're getting ready to load into the gate and they're getting ready to actually break from the gate for the six here at Santa Anita, I, I have no qualm saying that I, I hedged when I won the Aqueduct contest a number of years ago because I looked at it and said, it's 40 grand. And guess what? Like if I end up giving up 2,500 bucks to make sure, like you call it insanity insurance, I'm fine with that. It doesn't bother me, you know? Um, but for five grand or for two grand, eh, what? let's just let it ride and see what happens. As they're going down the backside, uh, thoughts, where did you land here? Uh, just in general, what are your thoughts in this spot? I, you know, I, I did a thing where I picked the same horses on everything except for this last one. And the strategy that I used was I picked the favorite in case I was really close and the favorite could get me home. And then I picked the two as well. But neither one of them are going to get me home. So I'm just rooting for whoever's name I see first that I know I'm rooting for Drew and Naomi to stay up there. So they have the four. So I'm rooting for treasure Hunter as he approaches the, uh, the quarter uh, It's the eighth pole. Yeah. I'm rooting, rooting for them as well, but I, I'm also in the cash contest and I'd like the nine to try to run this horse down, but I don't know if it's going to okay, happen. Well, I can root for that too. I, <laughs> look, I mean, uh, the problem is it just eight, depends yeah. who's going to tip me. Who, I mean, if you hit her, you're going to tip me because I'll root harder. Uh, no, I think I just I think we just got both of you guys beat. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's like Kevin eight, Dugan with a day, huh? Eight, four, nine. And that's one of those things, too. I, I feel like someone like Kevin Dugan, I don't know if he's involved in other contests. Uh, I, I don't see him in the, the 10K, but you look <laughs> you at this play, and you say, Go ahead. Do you ever play in like a $20 contest and you have like the day of your life and you're like, What the heck? Yeah. The yeah. Boy. Like, like I, I, I burned, I, I shot my shot. And it, guess what? This was the day that I could have won everything. And instead I'm going to get 25 bucks out of it. Like I get it. And, and it's, that was my point where somebody like Kevin Dugan, you, you crushed it and you were very clearly the best of the day. Um, you know, Popping I, I, 107 I, race sequence is serious. Do you, serious serious play. do you prescribe to the idea, the way that I've laid it out, I've talked about it on my podcast in the past, for a race like or a contest like this, let's say it's seven races uh, at the very minimum. I'm looking if you, I feel like if you really want to be involved potentially for the win at the very least to cash, you need to double up on what theoretically would have been bet. So in, in a spot like this, if it's seven races, four bucks each race, uh, you know, what are we looking at there? $36? No, that's nine by four. 28. 28. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at it saying I, you got to get close to $60, you know, 56 and change to have any reasonable chance. And again, 56 might, uh, yeah, 56 is probably going to be enough to get you in, but that's typically how I go into these things. If I, I can't at least I double up. I don't have much, a big chance. Yeah. It's hard, I, think it's hard I don't really, uh, people always ask me, you know, what do you think the, you know, they'll ask me in live bankroll contest too, breeders cup and everything. They'll say, what do you think the target is? What do you think the target is to win this thing? Man, you can't play that game at Del Mar. That guy hit that, that guy hit that uh, stormy liberal exacta and got to like one hundred and twenty eight thousand like early in the day. Like you can't, you cannot predict how you can't predict what's going to happen. Now, if it's a bunch cash of sick horse fields, cash to me is a totally different animal, right? But I, I feel the same way about like the NHC. People will say, "What's the target number?" Okay, I don't know, dude. Just play, man. Like I, like. You, you don't know. You, you have no idea what's going to happen in mandatory races. You've got no idea what's going to happen in, in optionals. You know, is there going to be a, is there going to be seven 60 to one shots that win on the turf? And, you know, it's just, I just think you're better off 
having a plan, looking at your whole run and having an idea of, okay, if I'm right, where does this get me? You know, and if you end up getting to 26 bucks, if you're right on everything, then you, you clearly know that you need to step outside the box a little bit there. That's probably not going to be enough. But some of my biggest scores in win place contests have been with just, you know, just hitting one to nine here, one nine shot there, hitting that two to one shot, getting a 12 to one to run second. Now enough to get me, to get me what I needed. So. Well, like you Ooh, say, I mean, every, every, every contest strong. is unique. You can't necessarily just prescribe to to one theory. They're all going to change. And you get a day like today where you give someone who hits a grand slam, even when the bases aren't loaded. That's Kevin Duggan. Uh, he wins with $108.40 in a seven race contest. I mean, that's. Do you have, you you have your ADW? Do you have an ADW up, Matt? Uh, I can pull one up. Yeah, what do you got? Can you tell me what that pick three paid at Santa Anita that he hit? I mean, look. People might not say that was cold, and yeah, I get it. It's not like cold from race four to race six, but he picked one horse. It was the eight in race four. He picked one horse in the fifth. It was the three, and he picked one horse in the sixth. It was eight, and 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 the the dollar pick three paid for a for a half. It paid almost six fifty. So I mean, you're looking at a thirteen hundred dollar pick three, and that That's those wrong. those are one of those where I sit back and I have I have no problem no qualms if someone just freaks out on me on a day and i say ah, you know tip of the cap to you you know round of applause good on you 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 just smashed me then there'll be other days where you know and again we don't need to go into the weeds of it but like if it feels like it's a stab at the very end of a contest i'll be like you know what i i i was better than you today but i i just got unlucky a day like today i don't think anyone when you're what 20 30 some odd dollars clear of the field. I mean, you're, you were the king today. So Kevin Dugan gets the job done. He is one of the 15 qualifiers for next Friday's Breeders' Cup betting challenge qualifier that we'll have here for the Horse Players Happy Hour. Second, William Arts. You know what? I'm just going to run them down. The people that are in, the people that aren't. Uh, Billy Bolch, Mark Winland, uh, Crescenzio Dakiyan, and uh, please let me know if I screw up your name. Is This is the fourth time. Uh, Brian Mustafa, Drew Coatney, Naomi Tucker. We know them both. Uh, Brett Pollock, Andrew Chung, Lucas Van Zant, Jerome Richmond, uh, Mike Langthorne, Craig Westing, West Husing, West Husing, West Husing, and Alistair Wallbaum. Unfortunately, Bubble Boy is going to be Corey Manning at 49-20, losing by 20 cents. But unfortunately, that, that's just how the cookie crumbles. That's how these games go. Um, just in general, for those of you that played, those of you that have followed along and had some fun with us, we can't thank you enough. This has been something I can only speak for myself. I, I look forward to this Friday thing every week, given the way everything has gone in the world and hopefully things are on the, the uptick. But at the very least, I know this is going to happen typically with both Jonathan and PTF this week. It was just the two of us. I thought it was great. Um, just in general, what are your closing thoughts before we sign off and, and sort of uh, check all the boxes that we need to before we wrap up? Yeah, keep in mind, we'd love to have you next week, even though the price point's going to jump up anyway. We still would love to have you. If you can't participate at that price point, we still hope you'd hang out. Uh, feel free to still donate, uh, you know, 10 bucks or five bucks or whatever you would normally be contributing with your $20 to TRF or TAA. Um, also, play in feeders this weekend and uh, and next week. It, uh, Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm sure they'll have Will Rogers and Fawner and whatever other, you know, places running in a circle and you can try to feed into our contest on Friday. So you can still participate without having to pony up the big money, but we'd love to have you. Um, it should be a lot of fun next week. It should be, it's going to be exciting because uh, you know, although what Kevin Dugan did today was impressive. Uh, he won $179. Yeah. <laughs> the, the person who wins next week and, and maybe a, a couple of people, if we have enough people sign up, We'll win ten thousand dollars in entry into the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge, one of the, if not the best, uh, betting contest uh, available in the world. No question about it. Uh, just for folks that are still sticking around and, and may have missed it, JK Plus One. You just had the Travis Stone pod come out. Uh, what's the story? What's the latest in the money podcast? Uh, we did a we did a late pick five at uh, we did Naira Betts show late pick five for tomorrow at Churchill. Beautiful. So head on over to InTheMoneyPodcast.com or anywhere you get your podcast, download right. them. Naomi's got, got a show as well. Who, who Naomi, Spencer. Yeah, I was going to say, Naomi's involved. Drew Coatney's involved. They're all ready to go for next Friday. You can, you know 
they're going to be locked in, ready to go, hopefully getting that $10,000 seat. Um, I'm not going to steal all of PTF sign-offs in here, but again, all the proceeds go to TA and TRF. So whether you've qualified, whether you, whatever the case may be, there's nothing wrong playing in these events, knowing that it all goes to a good cause. $20 buy-in, obviously, like Jonathan said, next Friday will be a little bit different, but this has been a production of the Breeders' Cup. Our friends over at Horse Players and Horse Tourneys and In The Money Media, uh, Jonathan Kinchin. I don't technically know what your title is, but you were one of the higher ups over there at In The Money Media. We'll, we'll leave it at that. I'm My just name that is guy Matt. that Pete was trying to make feel better about himself. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Matt Bernier, and I'm not going to steal PTF sign off. I'll use my own. Best of luck, however you play, whatever you play, and wherever you play. We'll see you next Friday for the BCBC Qualifier.